So, in this uh, third video on time series uh, modeling, we will uh, focus on the non-stationary time series, which have some kind of uh, uh, increasing or decreasing trend. And the central concept in this, uh, this is the so-called unit root, which we already uh, briefly discussed in the first video, when I, when I introduced the stochastic processes. And um, I want to also highlight that the, in the previous theme, when we talk about the static or dynamic models, uh, uh, implicit assumption at least is that uh, these time series were stationary. So there was not any kind of uh, growth trend in those, uh, on, in those uh, time series. So now in this third lesson, we'll then look into how to model the time trends. And uh, basically, there are two alternative approaches to modeling the trends. So perhaps the simplest approach would be to use so-called uh, deterministic trend, where we put uh, the, this kind of time trend uh, explicitly in the regression function. For example, I have in this first uh, uh, simple equation, I have a linear time trend. So I can put this index t as one of the explanatory variables of the, of the regression model. Of course, I could also take, uh, let's say, logarithm of t or t to power 2 or t to power 3. But in any case, it would be some kind of parametric function of this, uh, this uh, time index t, which we will put into this uh, uh, regression equation explicitly. So that would be a deterministic trend. In contrast, then, this kind of um, AR1 process that we considered uh, uh, when we have the so-called unit root, when this autocorrelation coefficient rho is exactly equal to 1. So remember these uh, simulation examples, how that would look like. Uh, so that would be an example of a stochastic trend uh, where we can have, for example, a random walk with the drift. So this is the second equation where uh, y imperial t uh, is uh, dependent on y imperial t minus 1. But then we also have some constant uh, mu which is referred to as the as the drift parameter. So I have included in the in the lecture materials of this uh, this theme uh, uh, two Excel files to to make this kind of simulated AR processes and the second file uh, labeled simulated trends uh, uh, allows you to simulate this both uh, deterministic trend or stochastic trend. And in the next slide, I, I show you some uh, examples of those uh, generated by this Excel file. So if you want to play around, uh, feel free to do so with this, uh, with this Excel file. But here is two, two examples that you can, you can generate with these uh, uh, simulations. Uh, on the top of this uh, figure, we have a, a linear trend, which is example of a deterministic trend. And on the bottom figure illustrates a sto stochastic trend. So if we, if we use this kind of uh, uh, parametric trend, so the time series would then look like something like, uh, if it's a linear trend, then notice that this, uh, uh, this uh, stochastic process has this kind of obvious grow, growing linear growth trend. Uh, so this, uh, this process is fluctuating randomly around this kind of linear, linear growth trend. Of course, it could be other kind of deterministic, it could be some kind of exponential growth or, or logarithmic growth or, or polynomial growth, whatever. It doesn't have to be necessarily linear, but, uh, but anyway, whatever kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, parametric function we put it, then, then this, uh, um, they, they will see the kind of random fluctuation around this some kind of uh, uh, postulated parametric growth trend. Uh, the situation is quite uh, different in the bottom figure where we have a stochastic trend. So this is a so-called random walk with a drift. Uh, so it's just the same uh, AR1 process that we have considered before. Now we have this autocorrelation coefficient equal to 1. And there is also this kind of drift parameter. The drift parameter is uh, important in the sense that it makes this, uh, uh, make this uh, stochastic process grow rather than decrease. So I will come to that uh, in more detail shortly. But uh, indeed, both these, uh, both these uh, approaches can be, can be useful for modeling, uh, modeling time trends. Uh, uh, it just depends on what kind of, uh, kind of uh, what, in some sense, what kind of growth we have. Is, is a linear 
linear trend suitable or some kind of, uh, let's say, exponential trend suitable, or is it rather more this kind of stochastic trend? And we can also uh, test empirically that which, uh, which kind of approach is uh, preferable. I will come back to that shortly. So a little bit more about this random walk with the drift. Uh, so uh, remember this uh, equation of this uh, first order autoregressive process AR1. So now I, I put this AR1 process uh, in terms of the dependent variable Y. And uh, notice that if we assume that there is also constant term mu, so this mu is uh, referred to as the drift parameter. So if this mu is positive, then uh, eventually this uh, this uh, random process will start to grow and uh, if mu is negative then we can have also a decreasing trend so of course i i talk more mainly in my examples about growth trend which is common in uh, if you model economic growth or or growth of uh, some some assets in the financial markets but uh, of course there can be also decreasing trend if we want to model let's say some air pollutant or or something like that which might be decreasing over time so it's also suitable for decreasing trends so the sign of this mu parameter then determines that it, do we have in the long term decreasing trend or increasing trend if it's positive mu then we have a growth trend and uh, notice that I don't have here this coefficient rho, which was this autocorrelation coefficient. That's because this rho is set equal to one, and we have this, uh, this unit root process here. So uh, I have here also, again, uh, manipulated a little bit this, uh, this equality. So notice that, of course, uh, y imperial t minus one is equal to mu plus y imperial t minus two plus epsilon in period t minus one. So this is what I have indicated with the red color equation here. So if we substitute the right-hand side of that red equation to the original uh, equality here, so notice that we can, we can then continue this same kind of substitution. We can always eliminate this, uh, this, uh, this right-hand side with the new uh, lagged value. So uh, ultimately then what this boils down to this kind of uh, random walk with a drift. So so on the bottom equality, we see that uh, if, if you do this substitution uh, all the way to the first period, then, then we will see that y in period t is in fact uh, uh, including t times this drift parameter mu plus then epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus epsilon all the way to period t. So like we discussed earlier, this kind of uh, uh, AR1 process uh, with autocorrelation coefficient equal to one. So that's the unit root. So when, when this uh, row is equal to one, then this uh, process includes uh, the sum of all of these random shocks epsilon in all, all time periods thus far. And now when we introduce also the drift parameter, so notice that, that we have also in period T, this uh, Y in period T includes T times this constant mu. So if mu is positive, then this drift uh, keeps increasing and increasing. And this will, this will force that whatever these epsilons are, so epsilons have a expected value of zero. So epsilons can be positive or negative. So, but, but then the expected value of yt is equal to uh, t times mu. So, so this will force that we have such kind of uh, growth trend when mu is positive or decreasing trend if, if, uh, if mu is negative. So that's why, this, uh, this drift parameter is also of relevance to, the, to, to modeling some kind of growth process. But, uh, but also notice that uh, this kind of um, a unit root process, uh, uh, now these kind of random shocks represented by epsilons, they don't die out, but they just keep accumulating and accumulating. And that makes this kind of uh, stochastic trend. So then what do we want to do then if, uh, if, we, if we have this kind of growth process, uh, I will come back to that also in the next lesson in more detail, but uh, to, to use this kind of uh, time series with the growth trend, we, we first need to detrend before we can put it to the regression model. And if you have a stochastic trend, for example, this uh, AR1 process with the unit root, then uh, we can convert it to a stationary process, we can eliminate this growth trend by taking the first differences. 
So, and this is what I have in, uh, indicated on this slide. So notice that if we then uh, take the difference, so not the, not the level of y, uh, but the growth of y. So if we take uh, y imperial t minus y imperial t minus one, so that is the, the growth of y, then this growth, ray, growth is equal to mu plus epsilon and mu is just a constant and epsilon is random variable. So therefore, if we take the difference yt minus y imperial t minus one, then the difference uh, is actually stationary. So the difference doesn't grow over time. So this is one way that we can, we can eliminate this, uh, this growth trend by using difference data rather than, rather than the, ac 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 this uh, original y's. And I have here indicated as an example that uh, uh, in this uh, previous example, when I did this uh, regressions on inflation rate on the sunspot numbers, I actually used the inflation rate rather than the price index. I will illustrate it in the example shortly. So on this slide, I have plotted the, the GDP deflator. So you can think about it as the price index. So of course the price level uh, if you take a very long time series, like here, starting from 1861 till uh, 2012, then of course the price level has increased this, uh, uh, tremendously. So it's uh, about uh, 20,000 times higher than in the, in the late uh, 19th century, at the end of this period. So it, there is this, uh, because of the inflation, uh, the price level tends to increase, of course, over time. But then if we take the difference and, and what I did in the, in this, uh, sunspot uh, number application, I actually used the inflation rate. So it is the percentage growth. So we can take the difference or like here, I use the percentage growth. Anyway, percentage growth also, uh, is, has this kind of difference built in. So notice that even though there is some kind of, uh, uh positive inflation rate and there are some very high peaks, but of course this, uh, percentage growth rate doesn't significantly grow over time. So there are sometimes some kind of periodic uh, uh, high inflation periods. But uh, when, when we talk about the growth rate rather than the level, then, then the growth rate doesn't anymore, uh, anymore uh, grow over time. So this becomes a so-called stationary series. So this stationary versus non-stationary intuitively, anything that is kind of, uh, uh, stable over time in the sense that, uh, that, okay, it can have a positive, uh, uh, positive level, but it's not growing, uh, over time. So like this inflation rate, so this would be a stationary series versus something that has such kind of obvious growth, like uh, that, like the price level or price index. So this would be non-stationary. So there is a growth, uh, uh, growth trend. And uh, it's important in the, if you use this kind of time series data in a regression model, then uh, for the reasons that I will explain in the next lesson, uh, it's not a good idea to have this kind of non-stationary data like this one. It's better first uh, detrend it by, by using the difference. So that's why in the, in the example, I used inflation rate rather than the price index. Okay. And yes, you can might remember also the sunspot number. Uh, was uh, fluctuating, but it didn't have any kind of obvious trend. So, so first step before you use time series data in the regression model, make sure that it is uh, stationary and you do this kind of detrending one way or another. So the first difference is, uh, can be a useful alternative. So here is then, then, uh, uh, why, why the unit root is so important. So, so that in fact, fact is this kind of, uh, uh, key distinction between, do we have a deterministic trend or stochastic trend? And, uh, in practice, then also the, how you should do the detrending depends on, do we have a unit root in a time series or not? So, uh, the general advice is that if you do have a unit root in your time series, so then you should use the first difference as the way to uh, eliminate this uh, growth or decreasing trend. Again, so if we have a unit root, then, then we should use the first differences. If we do have a, uh, if we do have a growth trend, but not necessarily unit root. So if we have a deterministic trend, uh, then uh, we can, we, instead of using the first difference, we can then use the, uh, for example, a linear time trend or quadratic time trend or, or exponential time trend. 
So a deterministic trend would be then the way to go if we do not have a unit root, but we have some kind of a growth trend. So this is why that concept of unit root is so important in the in the time series analysis. So typically, uh, when we when we use some time time series data, the first step, whatever we do, is to actually test that do we have unit root in the in the time series or not, because then that will guide then the following steps: what to what to do? Should we use the differences or or a deterministic trend in the model? And um, for that purpose, indeed, like I said, uh, uh, the first step is typically to use um, use a statistical test of unit root, and this uh, uh, this uh, famous Dicky Fuller test is the is the most widely used test of of unit root, and indeed this. Uh, uh, paper of by Dickey and Fuller is uh, is uh, one of the most cited uh, uh, cited articles in uh, in econometrics or economics more broadly. So here's the main principles of the of the Dickey Fuller test. So uh, in contrast to the usual kind of uh, kind of uh, a significance test that we have considered before. So notice now that the null hypothesis is stating that we actually do have a unit root. So it's not this kind of like uh, like uh, not significant, but actually we we state that the process has a unit root. Alternative hypothesis at is that uh, there is no unit root. So in that sense, then then deterministic trend would be would be preferred. So if we cannot reject the null hypothesis, we we uh, assume that there is a unit root, and uh, and uh, we would then use the differences rather than the. Uh, the level of the variable. So um, then, in practice, what we do, uh, we will we will estimate. Well, so so whatever time series we have, we then then denote it uh, by y. But this we also would do the same if we have some explanatory variables x. We also apply the same kind of test. But uh, I have here done it now for the variable y, and uh, we have just run a very simple. Uh, linear regression by OLS. So as the dependent variable, we take this kind of uh, a difference between y imperial t and y imperial t minus 1. And uh, there are multiple variations of this uh, Dickey-Fuller test. So we can have uh, have uh, this kind of AR1 process with, uh, now we have this uh, coefficient gamma is the parameter to be estimated. Uh, it's not exactly the same as this autocorrelation coefficient. Notice because we have this already moved this y imperial t minus one on the left hand side. So in that sense, if we have a unit root, then this uh, then this uh, gamma parameter that I have indicated here would be equal to zero. So so if this uh, what we have earlier indicated by rho the autocorrelation coefficient. Notice that if rho is equal to one, then gamma would be equal to zero. So we are testing now that is gamma uh, significantly smaller than zero. So if the null hypothesis is true, then gamma should be equal to zero. But if gamma is negative and, and significantly smaller than zero, then, uh, then we do not have a unit root and we, we, we would then accept the alternative hypothesis. So the Dickey-Fuller test is essentially a one-sided test. And if you think about the test statistic, this Dickey-Fuller test statistic that I have indicated by DF, it's essentially the same as the, the usual t-test statistic. However, uh, I should note that, uh, that the, the usual kind of uh, uh, t-distribution is not suitable for the, for the Dickey-Fuller test. So we need to use uh, uh, specific uh, statistical tables for the, for the Dickey-Fuller test. Or if you use theta, for example, then then uh, Stata can compute this kind of, uh, uh, I think it does some kind of uh, uh, bootstrap simulation to calculate the critical values automatically. So anyway, even though the test statistic is just the usual t-statistic, uh, notice that it's a one-sided test and that the usual t-statistic is, uh, or t-distribution is not appropriate. We need to use the Dickey-Fuller uh, tables or, or, or or test statistics. So if we, if we use, for example, this kind of uh, uh, statistical tables for the Dickey-Fuller test, we can do this test in, in Excel, for example, or whatever statistical software. Uh, one convenient feature of Stata is that uh, 
that uh, Stata provides these uh, critical values automatically, so you don't need to look for the statistical tables for the for the Dickey Fuller test or look for the critical values. So, as I mentioned, there are there are many variants of this uh, Dickey Fuller test. So I have here indicated three. So in the first case, we just have this. Uh, uh, gamma times uh, y imperial t minus one. So we don't. We just have a regression with a single explanatory variable, this y imperial t minus one, and uh, no constant term. So if we do include a constant term, so then this this uh, this intercept term would be the estimate of mu there. So that would that's then the drift parameter. So we can include the drift parameter if you like, and then we can also in this third alternative, which is the most uh, uh, in some sense, the biggest model is called the augmented Dickey Fuller test. So that includes everything. So it includes this drift parameter mu, which is just the intercept term as to be estimated. Then there is this uh, linear time trend, which is this t. Of course, we could have also some, some other than linear. We could have a quadratic or we could have exponential or logarithmic, whatever. But anyway, we can inclu include some parametric deterministic time trend. And then we still have this. Uh, gamma times mu. So essentially, what in, in whatever version we use, even if aug augmented Dickey Fuller test, remember, we are testing that is gamma significantly uh, smaller than zero. So it's a one sided test. So I have then applied this Dickey Fuller test, I hope this uh, this uh, following example will help to help to also illustrate. And one thing before I go to the example, I want to keep in mind that the Remember that the null hypothesis is that there is a unit rule. So if this uh, if this gamma is not significantly different from zero, then we conclude that there is a unit rule. So in this following example, I have used Stata because I, I, as, as you will see, then uh, Stata will get directly the view these critical values of the of the test statistics. So I have done this for the for the. Um, for the GDP deflator, so that's the price level. So remember this uh, this um, price index, which has this kind of very very uh, thirty time thirty thousand times growth from eighteen sixty one in the previous figures. So I have applied the Dickey Fuller test first to this uh, GDP deflator. Okay, and this is the augmented Dickey Fuller test. So so we have this constant term, which is this drift parameter or estimated drift parameter. I have linear time trend, but what is interesting for us is now this uh, uh, estimate of this uh, gamma parameter. And this is the first coefficient in this regression results below. So if you first look at this uh, usual looking regression results with a coefficient and standard error, t statistic and so on, uh, the first variable, it's this variable seven with the one period lag. So that's the coefficient of this uh, or estimate of this gamma parameter. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, the Dickey Fuller test is actually just the T test. So if you look at the T statistic if in this uh, regression result, it's 2.60. It's actually, actually the same as if you go to the top part of this, of this, uh, of this figure and we have this uh, a Z statistic. That's the Dickey Fuller test statistic. So this 2.595 is exactly the same as this 2.60. It's just this kind of rounding. A difference is just the rounding because we the other one is rounded with three decimals, other one is with two decimals. So it is just this T statistic. Uh, notice here that uh, that uh, Stata provides directly. You see there is this interpolated Dickey Fuller. So there is this critical value at one percent critical one percent significance level, five percent significance level, and also ten percent significance levels. And uh, Notice also that these critical values are all negative. So this is because, as I mentioned, uh, we are now using a one-sided test uh, and we are testing that is this uh, estimated coefficient significantly smaller than uh, zero. So that would be this kind of uh, stationary case when we have a AR1 process, but, uh, but this uh, uh, autocorrelation coefficient would be would be significantly less than one. So in that case, this uh, this uh, uh, coefficient would have to be negative and significantly negative. 
However, now, now in this case, we find actually that this estimate coefficient is positive. So we would need to compare this test statistic, this uh, 2.595 to these critical values. And in order to, in order to reject the null hypothesis, then this test statistic should be smaller than the, any of those negative values. But, but this is obviously not the case. So because this, our test statistic is uh, greater than the critical value, uh, whichever significance level we choose, whether, whether it is minus four, minus three, minus, minus 3.1, these, uh, these critical values, in all cases, the test statistic uh, uh, is greater than the critical value. So, so the test statistic falls to this except region of the test. So therefore, the conclusion here must be that the null hypothesis is maintained. And null hypothesis means that uh, we have a unit root. So there is a there is indeed a stochastic trend. So that was the case of the of this um, uh, when we had this price level and indeed already this uh, visual inspection uh, showed us that there is indeed very, very huge growth in this in this GDP deflator. So in this case, then then we we learned from the statistical test that there is a significant uh, uh, time trend. In other words, we cannot reject the null hypothesis of unit root. So the recommendation would be then to use the first difference. So then if you do this differencing, then, then it's recommended to also do the Dickey Fuller test again. So now I have done this kind of differencing by using the inflation rate. So notice that inflation rate was the change in the price level and I made it in a percentage term. So so the next step is then to do this Dickey Fuller test again for this difference data. So I have then applied again the Dickey Fuller test to the to the to the inflation rate. So this is the, the difference, proportional difference rather than this uh, price index. And the result look like this. So this is again data results. Uh, notice that the same regression we could do in in uh, in Excel, for example, or whatever statistical software. But then we should uh, uh, we cannot use the t distribution for the critical values. We need to then then find this uh, find these critical values for for example there exist such kind of statistical tables for the Dickey Fuller test. Uh, as I mentioned, convenient feature of Stata is that these critical values are automatically. Uh, provided when you use the Dickey Fuller test. Okay, so now when we have used the inflation rate, again I have used this augmented version of the of the test. So we have this constant term representing the drift parameter, and then we have this linear time trend, uh, and uh, and uh, we have also now this uh, difference uh, of the of the inflation rate. So now we are interested in this first coefficient, and and notice that now. Now this first coefficient uh, of this uh, variable four, uh, that's negative. So minus 0 0.2795751. So that's negative. Uh, the T statistic, if you read it from this uh, regression results, it's minus 4.90. 4 and it's exactly the same as the Z st statistic in this table above. So notice that it's minus 4.899. It's just the same as this minus 4.90. So that's the T statistic. And in the Dickey Fuller test, like, like before, we need to compare it to these critical values provided uh, here with this data. So at 1% significance level, it is minus 4.023. 5% critical level, it's slightly higher, minus 3.443. And 10% critical value is minus 3.143. So now if we compare this test statistic to the critical values, uh, remember that it's again this uh, one-sided test. So now in, in this comparison, the test statistic is smaller than any of those critical values. It's smaller even than the this 1% uh, significance level critical value. So therefore we reject the null hypothesis and null hypothesis for stating unit root so now when we have done this differencing, we see that we have now effectively eliminated the unit root by using the difference. So when we use the inflation rate, there is no longer a unit root. So there's no longer this kind of uh, stochastic growth trend. And uh, 
Notice that there's also the p-value below this uh, Dicky Fuller test statistic. So p-value is 0 0.003. So indeed, we can reject that uh, at the usual significance level, even at 1% significance level, we can reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, when we reject the null hypothesis, we conclude that, okay, there is no unit root. Uh, in a sense, it means that we have a stationary, uh, stationary process and therefore it's appropriate to use this kind of inflation rate as a variable in the in the regression model like we did in this uh, uh, previous uh, video lesson with this uh, sunspot number so that that confirms that uh, that inflation rate is uh, is stationary whereas this price uh, price index uh, was certainly not okay so, as I mentioned, this Dickey Fuller test is, is uh, very routinely nowadays used uh, to test any kind of, uh, any kind of time series. And, and like I like I illustrated here, then if you find that there is a unit root, uh, then, then usually the remedy is to take the first differences of those variables that uh, have a time trend. So use the change of the variable rather than the, the at absolute level. So I will continue then uh, in the next lesson to, to, to what can we do when, when we have this kind of uh, variables with, uh, with the time trend. And uh, I'll talk about also about so-called spurious uh, regression and then so-called co-integration analysis. Thanks for your attention and see you on the next video.